here and thank you all for coming out tonight. And I've got to be honest, I thought I knew all the pubs of Balmain, but this pub's a cracker. It's beautiful. Yeah, let me take you under my wing, you well, young thing you, and well, I will show you the pubs of Balmain. I am older than you, my friend, but please Well, I guess. And, and yes. I, am, I am so grateful that, apart from being a mate, one of my literary heroes, David Hunt's joining me. Can you please give David a huge round of applause? Please do, please do. I haven't had it for a while. Thank you very much. Um, Mikey. Yes, mate. Uh, you were referred to as an armchair historian. I've always considered you more of a Chesterfield. Yes, um, I, I, I... Sort of a human sofa of a historian. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I do some of my best work on the sofa. I, I, it, was, it was funny when, when I first saw the bio and the publishers, they went, armchair historian, I went... Ah, fair call. Ah, fair call. Is that the piece of furniture you associate with the most? Um, no, I don't like sitting in the armchair. No, I, my, my wife and I are very much couch people. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we, we, we managed to squeeze in our apartment a couch big enough that the two of us don't have to touch each other. But, but when the, It happens when you get older, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but, 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 but I know she's there when I need her. Oh, that's very sweet. Uh, um, uh, and the book is dedicated to Laura because, um, well, mostly <coughs> because it had to be really seriously. Um, I, I, right. no, I actually dedicated it to Laura in the, in the vain hope she might read this one. Um, <laughs> uh, she's up do, do, do you have like a, a potting shed that you go and write in? No, no. Actually, actually, what we what we found out was because, as you might imagine, I started this book. Quite, yeah, there's a fair amount of, you know, as you, you know, you know, with these sort of books, you just research and you figure out what you've got, then you start writing it. So I started it in early 2020 when um, the world was a very different place. And what would happen in my last two books was when I write something, and I've got some friends here today, they would know if I thought something was an in, in, interesting story, I would relay it to them over a drink or two at the pub and see, well, that's, yeah, I'll put that in, I'll put that in. Well, of course, with COVID, all there was was Paul Laura. Mm -hmm. And I actually said to her today, I said, uh, darling, do you, have, do you want to read this book? And she went, read it? I fucking lived it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 she, so actually, she's the beautiful woman in the back of the room. Could you give her a round of applause, please? Yeah. She, was, uh, she, she, was, she was my standing board. And what we did find out was after almost 20 years of marriage, yeah, um, more than twenty years of marriage. Um, the, a couple could during COVID, there a couple could actually share an office and not kill each other, which was, which was not bad. Yeah, full marks to you, my friend. Yes. Um, uh, one of the world's greatest armchair historians, Mark Twain, uh, wrote: uh, "Truth is stranger than fiction, mm. but it's because fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities. Truth isn't." That's fabulous. Uh, discuss. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> uh, we'll get to assholes later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, There's well, lots of assholes in your book. There, 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 there are more, more than a few assholes. Uh, mm. well, uh, actually, you made a good point. Uh, it's one of the reasons someone was talking to me. I was doing the interviews for this book, and they said, you know, This is your third history book. And they said, Are you tired of satire, of, of yeah, current events? I went, Oh, maybe I'm just getting old, or maybe we just live in a post satirical age. In so much as. I couldn't write weirder shit than what's happening in the paper anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, which means I'm now going back. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 what I like to say is you know, I, I'm trawling the shallow end of the history pool. Yeah. And I'm finding these stories that um, I know this sounds obvious, but it's good to remind ourselves. I, 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 I quote a few people. There's one genuine genius I, I quote in the book, and that's David Bowie. And Bowie has the line, always crashing in the same car. Now, if you look back at human history, we're always crashing in the same car. You know, I, I, I say very early on in the book, you know, we often say that the greatest achievement of prehistorical man was the harnessing of fire. I think the greatest achievement of prehistorical man was getting out of the cave without stabbing ourselves in the fucking foot with a spear. <laughs> so that's, you know, and that's where I... And also, too, let's be honest, David, stories about dumb people are fun. They are, they are, and and I would um, no. It ha it has been said by some. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly by me in this interview, uh, that the greatest influence over your historical works is Australia's Funniest Home Videos, uh, with your writing favourably compared to getting a frisbee in the balls yes. while bouncing on a faulty trampoline in a lightning storm. 
You know what? Um, if, if, if I could capture that in my writing, I'd be like... I, I, well, you do, Mikey. Oh, well, thank no, you. you do. That is the greatest compliment of all time. And uh, before we go any further, in the middle of the room... Yes. My old mate, Dave Gibson, who for many years was the voice of Australia's Funniest Home Video. <laughs> I'll never forget. Yeah. <laughs> and he will punch me in the throat for me when we get done. But look, so that's where you get some of your best stories from. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, it, it's funny, because... One of the things that motivated this book, you mentioned my last book, Reprehensible, which was histories of, uh, polite histories of bad behaviour. As I was researching that, I came across this fantastic quote by Alexander Dumas, the great French author, who said, um, I prefer rogues to imbeciles because they occasionally take a rest. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, uh, from that, I did a bit more research, on it and I came across a 1972 article by an Italian-born, but based at Berkeley University, economist. It's in the book. He lays down the five rules of stupidity. And first thing he says that intelligent people always underestimate underestimate how many stupid people there are in circulation. <laughs> that a stupid person is something that will do something for themselves to harm others, even if it causes harm unto themselves. A stupid person is the most dangerous person. True. Um, you know, I look, let's face it, there are a bunch of funny stories, but if there's a point in the book, it's like, yeah, dumb has been our constant companion. And we've got to keep an eye on it, because dumb, dumb is being really busy at the moment. <laughs> dumb, dumb is where the world is at, I think, Mikey. And um, you now have some of the dumbest research tools at your disposal. You've got Google. I've got Google. You've got Twitter. Yes. Uh, you've got carrier pigeons. Uh, carrier pigeons, I think. Well, um, well my, actually, actually, you make a really good point. I, I choose one story in the book, which is from the early 2000s, where these chain emails went around by pe people telling their friends that bananas. the bananas would give them something akin to the Ebola virus. Now, the reason I choose, and of course, the American Banana Association actually had to put on a hotline to tell people that bananas wouldn't give them a bowl of virus. Which makes people think. Which made people think, well, if they're doing that, then bananas are giving us a bowl of virus. But I chose that because it was before social media. Look, I'll, I'll make this point, you know, and I think it's a, it's a sort of a salient point, I suppose. The middle of the 15th century, the Gutenberg Press, the Gutenberg Bible, is the greatest democratisation of, of information that we know. It is how knowledge became spread. Also, within a few years of that happening, the Gutenberg press was being used to spread conspiracy theories and fake news stories. We're not going to talk Germans and Jews. No, no, no. no. But 500 years later, the internet looked at the Gutenberg press and went, hold the beer. Yeah. And the, the thing is, the point I'm, I'm, I'm making is the clothes have changed and the technology has changed, but the, the dumb hasn't. Dumb, you know, to, 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 to paraphrase Neil Young, dumb never sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, was going to be a title as a copyright issue. <laughs> um, Mikey, yes. is there any chance of Colin Farrell playing you in a movie? Uh, no. If not Brendan Fraser? Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> Maybe a young Brendan Fraser or a very old Colin Farrell. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mentioned Colin, Colin Farrell because there, uh, I, I, there's a chapter called Military Madness and there's that famous phrase, you know, that, that, that history is written by the victors, which is often misappropriated to um, Winston Churchill. And then I talk about other famous military phrases. And there's uh, one which is, it's, it's sort of a mashup of Plutarch, which is when Alexander gets to the, the River Indies and he says, and Alexander wept for he had no more worlds to conquer. Now, Alexander just had his ass handed to him by the by the, a mogul army, and he turned around and he went home. And as he was walking off, he said, and never let Colin Farrell play me in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's just funny, the guy I did the podcast with, a mate of ours, Paul, Paul Wilson, mm. I'm just going off on another track. Uh, Paul studied uh, about... Excellent you know, podcast. Uh, Excellent Heroes and Howlers and the rest of his history. David Hunt was in our first episode of the new season when we talked about personal heroes and howlers. You chose Al Alfred Deacon. As a hero. And who's your howler again? Ned Kelly. Ned oh, we're going to be here on my game now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Cop killer in a metal gin set. But, um, <laughs> but um, what was I talking about? Uh, 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 why Brendan Fraser is not playing you and Colin Farrell is, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> 
that's close. I'll move on. Next question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, there, there are currently three heroes history writers in Australia, uh, you, me, and Ben Podry. Yes. Uh, it seems that the main prerequisite to be an Australian humorous history writer is a pair of elasticised pants. Um, oh, you uh, know what? Should, should, should I try? Oh, my, 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 should my, my, I try Dr. Paul Bouchard's flesh-reducing uh, soap? Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, I call this chapter. Yeah. Uh, this was a massive hit in um, late Victorian, early Edwardian England and Australia. And it was a weight-reducing soap. And the idea was that you could painlessly, and also to, you know, with no adverse side effects, wash away body fat. <laughs> I've been using it for 20 years. Yeah. And, and same here. But, but, the, but here's the thing. It's ridiculous. The ads are absolutely hysterical to read. Yeah. And if you go online, you can still buy weight-reducing soap. This is, this is Peter Foster, the sort of a hundred and yes. uh, well, 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 actually, we'll, 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 we'll get to him later, but yeah, when it comes to you know, Peter Foster, all, all that sort of nonsense, Mark Twain, the great, well, one of the mm. great writers, you know, the great men of American letters, lost a fortune, almost a million dollars in, in today's money, investing in protein shakes. Protein powder. A penny a day reputedly would give you the protein of 16 steaks. Yes, I'd rather have 16 steaks, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mark Twain also uh, popularised, or, or failed to popularise, the baby clamp. Yes, this is another thing. When, when Twain lost his, lost his money, um, it was a clamp to secure your baby in its cot so it wouldn't roll out of bed, <laughs> as opposed to just putting a wall on the cot. But, but, but Twain, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, there's a great quote of Twain's where, where, where he talks about um, a man will do anything, uh, well, a man will do almost anything to be loved, but he will do anything to be envied. And Twain talks about how he constantly stuffs up his, his business mind. Like, even in public, you would think Mark Twain would know publishing. Mark Twain's first two books that he sold public, well, they were his own publishing company, were... Um, a version of Huckleberry Finn and Ulysses S. Grant's memoir, which is one of the great historical works of all time. He then followed it up by a memoir by, and I also did, I love this one, the way he sold Grant's uh, 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 memoir was he got old Union soldiers to dress up in their old uniform, they went door to door like, like, like broom salesmen. But then the next one, the next uh, Civil War hero I chooses is McClellan. Now, I don't know how many Ken Burns nuts we've got in. McLennan was an awful person. He tried to run against Lincoln, even though he was in the Union. And he was the man who Lincoln once famously said, if you don't intend using the army this week, may I borrow it? <laughs> oh, and, and so that flop. In fact, the only reason that Mark Twain came to Australia... Mm. He, was, he was broke. He was broke, he, exactly. He, 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 it's like an old rock band from the 80s yeah. having, having, to, having to do a tour to pay their taxes. <laughs> Twain toured the world to pay his back taxes. He also put out a Mark Twain watch, which didn't work. And, and going back... and going, The great thing about Twain too is every time things went bad for him, he had a great line. And the guy who was in charge of the uh, of the baby of, of the protein powder, he described him in court as a stallion in speaking, but a eunuch in action. <laughs> I empathise. I empathise. Yeah. Um, gullibility is the theme of the last section of your yes. book. Yes, won't get fooled again. Won't get fooled again. Whoops, just got fooled again. Uh, why, according to the great Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle? Should I leave a calendar on my porch? Ah. I do it anyway. The calendar. Um, this is part of a broader story. This is something that we don't really know of here. It's, it's not part of, of, of our tradition, not part of Anglo tradition. But for a long time in parts of Europe, werewolves were associated with Christmas. Now, this actually could go back to an ancient Greek myth. Thank you. That's all right. It's all Greek to me, but maybe yes. he can read it. And um, it goes back to an ancient Greek myth about a monkey boy. I used to do a TV show with one of them. Um, who would, around the 12 days of Christmas, would come out from the earth and harass farmers, their livestock. And it was sort of like this... Just for shits and giggles. Yeah, just for shits and giggles. Yeah. And so, so, so the Greek philosophers, you know, the, great, the great minds said the best way to stop this monkey boy from causing you problems 
used to leave out a colander. It actually had colanders in ancient Greece because the idea was that it would spend the whole night counting the numbers of holes and then go back in. But when it comes to werewolves, I mean, for, for centuries, in, in particularly the, around the Baltic states, it was thought that if a child was conceived on Christmas Eve, there was a fair chance it would grow up to be a werewolf because obviously its parents were being blasphemous. Uh, yes. Um, sh- uh, but you have to remember too, I uh, like... So Jesus missed it by that much. Just by that much. <laughs> um, yeah. And Jesus was an hairy man. Was an, Jesus was an hairy man. But, but, but uh, look, yeah, we've all seen um, uh, T- Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Well, the idea of telling really scary st- tales around Christmas is centuries old. And in fact, a were- the werewolf myth was so prevalent in uh, you know, a, a lot of the Nordic countries, around about Christmas time, farmers would make certain to, at the end of the day, gather all the manure from the fields that have been ploughed because apparently a werewolf loves a bit of cow or a horse dung to roll around him for some shape shifting. And this tradition kept going. And it seems to have, it seems to have crossed the Atlantic with, uh, with, 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 uh, with French people. In Canada, up until, I mean, seriously, in Canada, up until the end of the 19th century, people were convinced that someone who blasphemed could turn into a werewolf. <coughs> and even now, around, <coughs> around New Orleans, around the Cajun part of Louisiana, there will be depictions of Santa's sleigh not being pulled by Rudolph, but by being pulled by a red-nosed werewolf. <laughs> so, um, but, but, but you, you make, you, I, I think the point you're making is, um, and let's face it, the human capacity to believe absolute stupidity is, and, and, and always ties in with you know that sense of something that makes us feel good about ourselves. And, and what I love about that story is it was <laughs> two of the greatest minds of yes. world thinking that said, "Fuck it, you got monkey boys popping out of the earth. Just put out a uh, yeah, put, put, put a calendar on your porch. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's that easy. I've been doing it ever since, and I have not had any monkey boys uh, <laughs> molesting me and Pimble." Uh, for yeah, which, I'm, for you, which I'm very grateful. You really should spend more time. Yeah. You should, should spend more time in the inner west. Yeah, you're more, yeah. more time in the eastern suburbs. Yeah. Really. Yeah. We're, we're chock full of monkey boys over there. Yeah. Uh, you use two of my favourite words in uh, in ah. your chapters. I uh, use the word moon, mm. uh, which I like. In fact, it was the first word that I actually spoke uh, as a child. As really? Well, yeah. When I was one, I said moon. What did you drop? And then I dropped my dad. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and the other one is beaver. Uh, moon beavers. You, you've got moon beavers. Moon beavers, wider than a mile. Now, this is, uh, this is, this is, ah, thank you, thank you, you're very kind, you're very kind. <laughs> I, I'm here all night, try the deal. Um, well, this, this is actually an interesting piece when, when, when you talk about satire. Yeah. Um, there was a whole bunch of jiggery pokery going on at the end of the, you know, in fact, one, and, and pokery jiggery. Yes, yeah. for, for those that could afford it. Um, in the uh, one thing that keeps coming, that keeps reoccurring in the book is how Victorians got things wrong. And um, so, right at the end of the, you know, near the end of the nineteenth century, there was a famous British theologian, stroke astronomer, who wrote about all these extra. You know, creatures that inhabited the world. Thomas uh, Dick. Uh, the, the, the universe. Thomas Dick. Yeah, Thomas yeah, Dick. The moon, beaver, Dick. Yes, yeah, they've got a thing going on. And, and, and he actually believed that uh, the sun was filled with like 40 million semi fallen angels. Well, anyway, there was a writer in a New York newspaper who decided to take the piss out of it. So he wrote an article about the moon beavers. And he described how the moon was populated by six foot tall bipedal beavers that built their own huts, feasted on cucumbers, and, and, um, and mined amethyst. Here's the problem with satire the audience has to get it. <laughs> the audience was enthralled. A bunch of and this was all viewed from a telescope yeah, yeah, from by a t- John Herschel. Yeah, 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 John so H- there's somebody looking at giant yes. skating beavers eating cucumbers. Yeah, exactly. And, yep. and, and they and, believed it. And, and to the point where Princeton University sent four academics that, down there. And so the people at the, at the newspaper, they spent a week just sending them in between offices and they had a, they had a printing press there and the, the editorial office there. And they went up and said, well, we're not quite sure. The New York Times congratulated him on his academic renown for writing this piece about moon beavers. 
eventually he had to put an article saying it's all there nonsense. Was, there were unicorns on the moon. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, some, some, of the moon, some of the moon beavers would yeah. ride unicorns. Yeah. Yeah. Whilst they're in cucumbers. He had to put out an article saying it was all nonsense and still people wouldn't believe it. And then there was a conspiracy. Oh, no, you know, yes. you see the, the government's got to it. Well, well, like, they shut him down. Well, well, well actually, when you, when you talk about conspiracy theories, that's the great flat earth thing. Yeah. In the 90s, er, Flat Earth, yeah, the whole thing about Columbus thinking the world was the only person who thought the world was round, absolute nonsense. Bullshit! Well, well, in fact, Columbus believed the, the Earth was shaped like a breast. It was kind of creepy, actually. And the, the nipple was the closest to God. Yeah, Columbus that had was a lot, actually pretty creepy. Columbus had a lot of issues. But by, 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 by the Middle Ages, no one believed that the, that the world was flat. Then you get the Victorian era, and you get Washington Irving, who we all know from uh, Sleepy Hollow, uh, um, um, well, uh, Rip Van Winkle. Yep. Rip. He writes a multi volume biography of Columbus. That is around, around at the same time as the concept of American exceptionalism was taking over. So he has to make Columbus seem more exceptional. So he goes, well, he's the only one who believed the world was round. And then he finds this guy called Indoclipus. Cos Cosmic in the clubs, a really obscure 9th century, no, 6th century hermit, who had put out his... As opposed to a popular, well-renowned hermit. Yes. Got out of life. Yeah. Well, well, I think he actually put out these six beautifully bound volumes, which, which, which was basically postulating that the Earth was flat. So he becomes the pin-up boy for the Victorians believing that the Earth was flat. Then what happens in the 1960s, a British guy comes along and he's the head of the Flat Earth Society. He's also a sign writer, apparently a pretty good sign writer. Anyway, so he's... Um, the, Did he have a sense of perspective? On no, absolutely no. none. None whatsoever. <laughs> but, but, but the bizarre thing was, he then... Um, it's the 1960s. So, um, you, you've been there, I've been there. When, yeah. you're putting, when you're putting together a TV panel, you always need one nut job to add some colour. So he came on. Normally it's you and I. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're using the nut job at the end. And, and so, so what happens is he then, you know, he, he, would, he would go on and say that, you know, they, no one would, went to the sea, they were hypnotised and all that nonsense. But he's the first one who then pulls together the idea of not only is the earth flat, but the government's keeping the truth from us. And he's the one who starts the conspiracy. And that's where the conspiracy... And right now... And this, this actually, I had to go. I had to find some pretty old research. This research is about 10, 12 years old. 2017, like yeah, I just read a book the other day. 2017. Uh, about 7 of Americans think the Earth's flat. Um, and what I love, whenever it comes to nut jobs, those those flat earthers, they're not really at war with the government. They're all at war with each other. They all think, well, no, your flat Earth theory is wrong. My flat Earth theory is right. Mm -hmm. And yes, my well, Earth is flatter than yours. Exactly. <laughs> And and the, uh, and then the, you know, as I said, the Victorians got involved. But is, is that whole thing of like, just you know, once you once you mix something that's blatantly false with the idea that the government's keeping you from the truth, it sells, baby, it sells. It does, it does. It's it's very scary stuff. Uh, the first section of your book, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Yes. Uh, the first story in your book was called "Posting Babies." Yes. How do you post a baby? Okay, it's 1913. The US Post Office decides to raise the amount of weight you could send as a, a, as a parcel through the post. And so someone said, so how much does Timmy weigh? Actually, it was little Jimmy. The first child sent through the post was a baby called Jimmy, whose parents put a stamp on him and sent him 25 miles to his, his grandmother's house. <laughs> For 15 cents, which yeah. is value for money. But then, but then during, from 1913 on, it gets, gets ridiculous. There was one young girl... Edna Neff. Edna Neff. In fact, there's a, in fact, there's a child's book written about her. Edna Neff was sent over 1,100 kilometres from... You're not going to believe this. She starts in Florida and ends up um, up, up near Maine. And her, her parents were posting her. 25 cents. 25 cents. Even better value for money. But here's the thing. I will say this. That they didn't lose a child, but it, but it took the US. Your post child always gets through. Your child, yes, <laughs> rain or hail or sleet or snow. But the thing is, it took the US Post Office a year to go. 
you know what, posting kitties ain't that good an idea. <laughs> Mainly because they're foreigns. Uh, yeah. You stick a stamp on their forehead and they sweat a bit, it falls off. It's, um, I, I it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can't run on their back, return to sender. <laughs> <laughs> Not in, not in some of the states after Roe versus Wade. No way. No. <laughs> um, oh, 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 joke, oh, joke, oh, joke. Oh, oh, we're getting political there. Oh, little, little getting dark. political there. Oh. Uh, your second section, my favourite, is Medical Adventures, A Spoonful of Stupid. Yes. Uh, now, we have both written extensively about tobacco enemas in yes. our books. Because that's our gig. Uh, well, uh, uh, could, you, could you enlighten the audience on the tobacco <laughs> enema? Well, well, let's start. The first person to write an anti-smoking pamphlet was James I of England, James VII of Scotland, and he described it as, as, as a foul, wholesome you know, malady. But around about the same time, the uh, Royal Society of Physicians said, no, it's all right. Okay. So it was actually compulsory in the, in the uh, 18th century for Eton boys to smoke a pipe, mm. and if they didn't, they were beaten. But you know, they liked it. They did. That's <laughs> what you pay for it. Even. But but, but then, the, then the wild thing was in around right about 1774, um, the Thames in London set up these posts along, you know, these, these sort of life saving posts along the Thames for people who would who would fall in fallen in and almost drowned. Now in those posts, were well, little boxes, was a length of tube, a pouch of tobacco and a clay pipe. Now the idea was the, the tobacco would raise the heart rate and the smoke would dry you out from the inside. So they'd stick a pipe in, <laughs> light the okay, okay, look, 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 let's, let's, let's not bet around the bush or the, or, or the other bit. Um, they, they, they would stick a, a, a pipe, a metal pipe, up your ass on the bank of the Thames. Yes, and, and then they would take a few puffs on the clay pipe and and that's where the phrase blowing smoke up your ass comes from. <laughs> this is true. It's true. This and, is true. And, and, and in fact, you the, cannot make this shit up. And in fact, the, the only addendum they made to it yeah. was several of these lifesavers started getting very sick. Cholera. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. At this stage, yeah, the Thames is, but yeah, it's an open sewer. It's full of cholera. Well, and so is a so is a, a, a person's ass. <laughs> well, yes. What the point? Yeah. So they went. Oh, we better we better change things here. I well, let's add some bellows. <laughs> so, so, so people would, would smoke the pipe, blow in the bellows. <laughs> Can you imagine drowning? Uh, like yes. falling into the Thames, waking up, and there is some toothless sailor, uh, your pants are down around your ankles, and he's blowing the smoke up your jacksie. I can imagine that. that that's oh, I imagine that most nice. That's, that, that's how I got my first job at the ABC. <laughs> Um, it's go, funny because it's true. Yeah. Um, before we go any further, I believe Mr. Hunt and I are in need of some libation. Oh yes, uh, uh, a pint of uh, pale ale, please, and Mr. Uh, Bartender, and a glass of anything other than um, what you just had. No, no, no. no. The, sh- the Chardonnay is lovely, thank you. Yeah, you're stunning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, while we are indulging in the anal, uh, fill us in on far charts. Okay. As I said before, I wrote a fair amount of this book during lockdown. And when, not a laugh line, but thanks. Um, but, but, what were you doing alone with your dad? I, I know, but, but, but the thing was, um, so obviously, plagues came into it. And um, I was looking at the history of the, of, of the Great Plague of London. Now, this, it was kind of weird, because the Great Plague was thought to be a miasma, which was a foul air. Actually, it wasn't. It was fed by, by rats, off, oh, fleas off rats. But the thought was that um, if you could find something really sticky, that would scare the plague air away. So you had really wealthy Londoners coming out of the country, buying the smelliest goat they could, and setting it up in their parlour to keep the plague away, which is again, not bad thinking. But they had a plan B. If you, if your budget didn't run to a goat, or if you had to spend a fair amount of time out of the house, you could buy a specially designed glass jar. You would fart in the jar and then pop a cork on it. And if you found yourself somewhere plaguey, <laughs> just have a quick sniff. Which, which was basically London. Which is London, yes, yeah. which was, yes exactly. Anywhere in London. And this would ward off the, um, the plague. 
which sounds ridiculous until you realise that people were actually injecting fish tank cleaning bleach in 2021. Yeah. So. <laughs> And, and, and taking wound tablets. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I mean, in, in, when, you know, while, while we're talking about you know, the COVID thing, another thing which is really... I mean, it's probably the strangest title I've ever written to a, to, a, to a story or a chapter. It's called Fun with Syphilis. <laughs> now, do you remember... I hated him saying his name. Trump. Oh. Yeah, the China flu, the Kung Fu flu. Yeah. Well, the first recorded episodes of syphilis in Europe uh, occurred during the French Naples War. Now, depending on which side you were on, it was either the Naples disease or it was the French disease. So we've actually been quite xenophobic in naming diseases for a good 600 years. And what, what, what one of the, the, the I also write extensively about syphilis because I get off on that sort of stuff too, yeah. was known as um, la maladie anglaise oh, like, by, yeah. uh, by, by, by the French and of course the French fox by the English. And if the English didn't like something, they named it after the French. Yes. It was a bit dirty. Uh, French postcards. Yeah. Uh, a French letter. French, le- French kissing. Yeah, French kissing. Yeah. Not in the USA. Oh, uh, I love not it. after I love the American it. Revolutionary War. Um, but, but basically, if you didn't like something or you thought it was a bit dirty, you named it after the French. And, and the French did the same to the English. While, while we're talking venereal disease in the French, why don't, why don't, why don't Let's, yeah, we, can, we can milk that for another 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my little favourite little bon bots, a little, little side um, diversion from the book is while I'm writing about civil like, Also, I thought I'd throw in a paragraph on gonorrhea. Now, there's <laughs> just a paragraph. <laughs> yeah, there are two theories on why it's called the clap. One is it comes from Capier, which is an old French word for a brothel. That sounds fair enough. It's incredible. Yeah, there's another reason, man. gentlemen in the room, I'm sorry for going any further. Yes. If uh, you had an infected willy from gonorrhea, they thought they could um, knock out the infection by banging two bits of wood together, hence <laughs> the clap. And, and, and actually, if you were religiously inclined, as most people were, you'd, you'd, you'd stick your old fellow in the Bible, a heavy Bible, and slam it down as well. That's <laughs> it. My research is, is um, even more obscure than uh, David. Did you did you go to a Catholic school? <laughs> one one never kisses and tells. Oh, yes. um, in your section, under the influence, under the influence, an entire section, uh, <coughs> uh, drunkenness yes. uh, and and foolishness. Uh, you vomit up some historical hangover cures. Um, yeah, talk well, us through yeah. through some of them. Well, um, one of my favourites is an ancient Greek one, mm. which the Romans loved as well, which was a deep-fried canary. <laughs> <laughs> with cabbage juice. With cabbage juice. Yes, with cabbage juice. Okay, mm. yeah. Who hasn't reached for some KFC after a big night? <laughs> some Kentucky Fried Canary. Yeah, it's, it's uh, but uh, I, I, I know where you're going with this one. Huh? It's the... Um, the dunking of the testicles mm. in vinegar and cabbage. Well, no, salt and vinegar. No, just salt, salt and vinegar and testicles. <laughs> salt uh, and vinegar testicles. One of my, uh, the ring of truth this story has. Yes. Uh, John of Gaddesden, the early 14th century physician, yes. the second, said, My lord, mm. if you have been imbibing too much of the mead, uh, just dunk one nut in some vinegar and sprinkle it with salt. <laughs> salt and vinegar nuts! Mm. Good work. Good work. <laughs> Um, but, 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 mind you, I, I think I think my favourite one is, is the Irish the Irish cure at the end of that, which is if you got particularly drunk and you knew it was going to be a bad night, you get your mates to bury you neck deep in sand, and just pray to God they remembered where they buried you before the tide came in. <laughs> oh, that's right. We're off on a frolic of our own. Yes. Uh, and, and actually, very, very, one of my favourite stories too about under the influence is going. I, I, I just talk about you know, the various stages of alcohol and how alcohol can make smart people do dumb things. Karl Marx, Karl Marx, the, you know, the economist, the philosopher, that stern face we were for the posters, got thrown out of university for drunken donkey riding. And in fact, if you think. <laughs> this, this reminds me of the old Monty Python song, you know, the, 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 the old thing. If you, if you thought Mars could drink, Engels was a huge spot. Yeah. In fact, there's one night, well, there's one story when he and Engels first reunite, and they go on a, a four-block pub crawl of a certain part of the eastern of London, 
And, and there are about 10 pubs in every yes, pub. Yes, yeah, 10 yeah. They get so drunk, the cops almost arrest them. I just love the idea of Karl Marx pissed off his head. <laughs> yep, no, um, it, it works for me too. Um, uh, one of the things, and this is, uh, have people here seen horrible histories at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it, it's done more to make history relatable to the general populace than anything else. Um, it's a wonderful show. And they've got a, a segment in that show called Stupid Deaths. No, oh, yes. you've got lots of stupid deaths in your show, yes. in your um, in, in in your book. One one thing that <coughs> had me pissing myself with laughter was the various stupid ways in which various Greek philosophers have died. Yes, um, uh, in, in fact, that's probably the furthest I go back in terms of research. Um, Dracos, the great Athenian, the lawgiver, the lawgiver, is from whom we get the word draconian, because you know Dracos did give Athens the codified set of laws that made it the most powerful state along with mm. Sparta. Jaywalk, death. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah his idea of laws, death. Look Not out your window, funny, death. death. Yeah. So what happens is he is so beloved by the people for actually turning Athens into this functioning state. He and and a, death factory. A death factory, yes. Yeah. He goes on a tour. Now, did anyone see on the news last night Harry Styles complaining about people throwing you know, objects and clothes? Yeah. Well, Dracos is so beloved at one public event, people are throwing robes and cloaks and, and hats. hats. And hats, yeah, big, like, sun hats. And that's how Dracos died. He suffocated under the weight of his adoring public's hats and cloaks. Um, is it like a guy who, who imposed so much death on other people? Yeah, I know. And, I and, and who is this towering figure, it was sort of death by Tom Jones. Concert. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, I, believe, I believe his last words were, it's not unusual. <laughs> <That's> not <laughs> Very good, sir. Uh, Heraclitus of Ephesus. Ah, uh, Heraclitus, yes. This, this is a man who was so weird that um, other philosophers didn't want to hang with him. Um, this is the dung one, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was, um, he, he, had, he had bad humours. He wasn't feeling well, so he thought the best way to leech this out of his body was to make up a, a poultice of, of, of clay and manure and um, sit out in the sun. That's not what killed him. What killed him was the pack of wild dogs who found someone who couldn't run away. <laughs> he couldn't actually break out of his pole <laughs> so he was consumed by wild dogs. Oh, I mean, seriously, for a wild dog, that's a free lunch. Can I just... <laughs> uh, and, and, of course, we have Chrysippus the Stoic. Chris, okay, but he, he was, like, I, I regard Stoics as yes. serious people yeah. who you say, uh, shall we go out for a night in the town, and they say... No, no, I have work to do. I have work to do uh, in, in as miserable a way as possible. Oh, well, but Christopher the Stoic was a pisshead. Oh, yeah, absolutely pisshead. And he died. He died of it. And not only was, was he a pisshead, but you know, Christopher was so, so central to the idea of Stoic philosophy that even later Marcus Aurelius would write, there would have been no Stoicism without, without Christopher. My, my other favourite quote of Christopher too is, um, a, a wealthy a, a Greek merchant says, who should I send my son to to learn philosophy? And he goes, well, obviously, to Christmas, because there is no one else. So he had, he had a fair opinion of himself, but he had this thing, um, particularly when he got drunk, uh, he would giggle hysterically and wave his feet. It was actually recorded. So he, it was re recorded? It was, well, yeah, by, by, by someone, so probably nasty. But he'd been at one of the early Olympic Games, which were, if you weren't a competitor, it was a day of just... Okay, he, he won the feet wiggling yeah, competition. Well, this is probably like this. If you've ever been in a corporate box at the yeah. footy, yeah, well, the Olympic Games, it's like that times 10. So he's absolutely plastered. He's walking home. And there's an old woman with a, with a donkey. And he says, give the donkey wine. And so she gives the donkey wine. And the donkey starts braying. And, starts, and he just thinks this is the funniest thing in the world. And the story goes that because of this donkey and the fact he was, he was off his head, the father of Stoic philosophy died laughing himself to death. <laughs> Out of piss donkey. Out of piss donkey. What a way to go. You know, you know, and here's the thing. That's, you know, that is, is the bit of Greek archaeological play that I want to see. I want to see that in red and black pottery. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, uh, now, in your military madness section, you yes. chronicle, uh, and this, this really appealed to me, 
You chronicle the Potsdam Giants. Who were they and how were they recruited? King Frederick Wilhelm I of Prussia. Now, the father of Frederick the Great. Yeah. But King Wilhelm I, um, he had a thing for military people, soldiers. But not just that, he liked them tall. Mm. He said, The most beautiful girl or woman of the world would be a matter of indifference to me, but tall soldiers are my weakness. Oh, yeah. Oh, and they were. In fact, in fact, so much so, he would pay for them by the metre. <laughs> the taller you Get, were... Getting your carpet laid? Yeah, getting your tall soldier laid. Exactly. Same thing. But, but the thing is, they never actually went into battle. So if you're a tall person in Prussia, yeah. this was a good gig. It was just... You, you, got, you got more rations, you got more pay than anyone else, and you basically were just there on the parade ground. In fact... It was said that uh, if Wilhelm I was feeling a bit crook, he'd get a few soldiers to parade past him just to cheer him up. I think we you know where we're going with this. Uh, it then gets creepier and spookier. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He, um, <laughs> he, he actually has an Irishman kidnapped, and this is done through his ambassador. Oh, that that would be James Kirkland. Yeah. 2.17 metres tall. Which, 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 which is bloody huge. Which is fucking big! And, and, uh, in fact, in fact, uh, 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 one of the first, um, uh, the first ambassador, the quality of King James, oh, this is disgusting, what's what I say? I have discovered an Irish horse you might be interested in. So he's tipped, mind you though, he's tempted over there and, and what, he actually becomes one of the guards and uh, actually retires in Potsdam. But then there's one story which is, is true. Um, what, and another member is the carpenter. The carpenter. Uh, we've talked about posting babies, now we're posting giants. Yeah, so, okay. so yeah, exactly. So, so, so what happens is uh, this uh, high ranking general who's, who's part of the court is out in a, in a small town in sort of Bavaria, I suppose you'd call it, a, a few hundred k's from, from Potsdam, and he comes across this carpenter who looks perfect for King Wilhelm the first. He goes, he goes, oh. And so he offers him, you know, do you want to come? And he goes, no, he's making a good living as a carpenter. He goes, okay, he said, could you do me a favour? I, 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 need a, I need a box to transport things. You know, a box that is exactly your heart. Exactly. <laughs> and so... So the carpenter builds a box with a lid on it. You know, you see what this is going. And the next day, this this general comes back and goes, "It's not big enough. You see, it's 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 smaller than you." So the carpenter goes, "Oh, I'll prove him wrong." He jumps in the box. At which point, several soldiers throw the lid on and nail it down. Now, if any of you ever used to collect stickhead sex when you were a kid, you put them in your shoebox. You got to drill some holes. Yeah. So by the time it gets back to Potsdam, it dies. If this poor man dies. And, and then, then it, it, like, you know, I thought this was a happy book. Right? No, well, like, you know, there is this thing. You know, there are there are bad results for stupidity. Then what happens? Um, he has people going out around the countryside in Prussia, looking for tall peasant children to kidnap and take to court. So you know, remember Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? Think of it as, as a creepy... I mean, as, people would hide their tall children. They'd build special <coughs> elongated bolt holes to yeah. put their children in. Yes, yeah, yeah. and, and there, also two men, uh, there were also emissaries from the court who would go into hospitals and put a little scarf around the foot of a child that might be, grow up to be tall. Then they started importing tall women to breed with the tall soldiers. It, it, gets, it gets worse. This, this is the Germans for you, ladies and gentlemen. And, 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 and in fact, this is where the eugenics comes in. In, in fact, really? yes, in fact, um, Hitler and Himmler would later refer to this in terms of breeding. Darwin would say at the end of the 19th century, humans have never been bred like stock apart from the Potsdam giants. But to this day, there's a lot of really tall people in Potsdam. Yeah. Not, not worth it, though. No, no, true, um, and 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 the, the the particularly sad bit of that uh, that story that 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 really moved me uh, as, as as much as I can be moved is that um, some children who were picked up yes. and they didn't grow quickly enough to stretch. He was he put them. He, no, he he actually had a rack installed, and and yeah. <laughs> let's get back to the light stuff. They're freaking out a bit. He would actually he would actually have them stretched while he sat there with a Madeira. And some and some uh, and some lunch. It, look, yeah. like, like it's I've single-handedly killed your book sales in yeah, that no. conversation. It's just like the, the rest is fun. The rest is yeah. fun. Yeah. The rest is, 
Um, um, let's finish before we go to audience questions with John Parker. Ah. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's bodyguard. Yes. I, 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 it was a bit crap. Okay. Uh, yes. if, if, if well, history has proven it was a bit crap. Well, well, he had a history of crap. Well, 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 actually, it's, okay, this is the famous night where, where, where Lincoln is killed in Ford's Theatre. Now, you, 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 you know the story, so I'll, I'll let you tell it. That's because I've read your book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I didn't know it before. Um, I, I, yeah, John Parker was a, a policeman in, in, in Washington, in the Washington area, and his greatest skill was not being fired. Now, do you want to tell the, the story about the trolley car? I do, I do, because this was the thing in the book that gave me the biggest laugh. Mm. This is a policeman who uh, is hired to be a bodyguard for the president who has a, a history of foul language and drinking on duty, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, for quenning a brothel... <laughs> it's, it's what we're doing now. For, for, for quenning a brothel, I'm, I'm, I'm not up for that kind of shit, but back in the day, I understand that sort of thing happened. Uh, what I like, is, and, and he didn't get fired for these things. No. Why didn't he get fired? Apparently, according to contemporary, um, you know, his, mate, his friends at the time, it was later written, he was a really good amateur courtroom uh, performer. Bullshit he, artist. He, he's a great bullshit artist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but my favourite uh, story uh, for not getting fired was when he was found asleep on a streetcar when he was meant to be patrolling his beat, and he claimed that he'd heard a large quacking sound on the streetcar and thought a flock of ducks may have taken up residence on said streetcar, and he was investigating this particular duck-related crime when he, when, he, when he was so overcome by the excitement of the ducks not mm. being there that he fell asleep. <laughs> um, and so this is the guy who is, who's hired to... to you, can, you can take this from me. Well, you have to remember, the Secret Service was only really put together in the last few months of the Civil War. There have been several attempts on Lincoln's life. In fact, going back to when he, when he actually was <laughs> the presidency. But, then, uh, but my, my two favourites, this happens before, was um, actually, a, a few, this is the one that brings it down to the Secret Service. A few weeks before, someone shot at Lincoln while he was riding around Washington. And for, you know, if you're going to hit Lincoln, you're going to hit the hat. And the ball, the ball, but and, you know, JFK should have worn a big hat. Exactly. Or just, that would have, yeah. just ducked. Yeah. Uh, actually, here's the thing: if you have also in the Spielberg film Lincoln, where there's a, one scene where Daniel Day Lewis takes his hat off and takes his notes out of it, Lincoln used to do that. Lincoln used to carry his speech notes around in his hat. The other stupidest um, uh, um, assassination attempt on Lincoln was there was a Confederate sympathiser who was a doctor, yes. Luke Pryor Blackburn. Luke Pryor, and, and what he was doing was he was going around prisoner of war encampments and getting clothing from men who died of smallpox. Yellow fever. Oh, sorry, yellow fever. Yellow fever, yellow fever, yellow fever. yes. Thanks to... No, because it works better than yellow fever. This yeah. And uh, he then had these, um, these clothes made up, um, the fabric made up into some lovely shirts, which he had sent to Lincoln. And they, the idea was it would kill him. That didn't work. Anyway, so... And it didn't work because yellow fever is... Is, is, is not spread by clothing or touch. By, 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 by mosquitoes. By, by mosquitoes, yes. <laughs> but you've read the book more recently than I have. <laughs> I fucking wrote the book. No, no, this no. is my front. This is my front. No, actually, the last time I actually read the book cover to cover was I did the audio version. And that's when I realised the third book... My year seven French is just not up to it. <laughs> but anyway, so, so going back to John Barker, so on the night of the you know, Ford's Theatre, he turns up late. Okay, fine, that's fine, because they weren't arrived until halfway through the first half of the play. So they get to the play, and you have to remember, my American cousin was a hit, not only in England, but in America as well, it was a hit on Broadway. It was like, Sort of like the 1865 version of a Neil Simon play in the 1970s. Like or, or Cats. Yes, with less bum holes. And, um, <laughs> so so, so uh, Mary Todd and, and Abraham arrive, and John Parker, the bodyguard, takes his post out the front of the presidential box. He hears the audience laugh, so he leaves his post to get a better view of the play. He then, halfway through the second half, realises he doesn't like the play. And there's a tavern next door. So he leaves the theatre to go to the tavern. Now, this is just my theory, but I've broken down the timeline of that night, and there's a fair chance that as he's crossing the laneway to go into the tavern, John Wilkes Booth had been knocking back a few shots of, shots of courage. 
is actually walking uh. into the theatre. So, uh, and so, so you have to remember, this is, uh, getting back to the, point, to the point of the book, it's one of those moments where what if something really stupid hadn't happened? Because the America we live with now is the result of Andrew Johnson, probably one of the worst presidents of all time, mishandling of Reconstruction. What would Reconstruction have looked like under Lincoln? And for this bloke to get bored with the play and go to the pub, next thing you know, history just turns 180 degrees. Wow. Yeah. Oh, thanks for the wow. Yeah, no, no. Well, and, and that is the great, about, the great thing about history. It's those sliding doors or those sliding... Yeah. Theatre doors uh, of the booth. Um, it was John Wilkes booth in a theatre booth. Well, like, well, how many other how many other people have assassinated somebody in something that bears their name, Mikey? Well, well actually, the, the, <laughs> the amazing thing about John Wilkes booth, and, and I, I, I couldn't put this in the book. You have to remember the the booth family were like the Hemsworths of America. <laughs> and in fact, um, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're famous famous actors. You're right. In fact, um, I actually wrote about it in my last book. King Lear, for many years, was actually rewritten as a light romantic comedy. The first production in America on Broadway, which went back to the original text of Shakespeare's Lear, was done by Wilkes's brother. But here's where it gets really weird. So the whole Wilkes Booth family are New York, Broadway-based, and there is one story which is never... It's one of those ones that gets hinted at. By, by, by certain historians, that before the Civil War, Lincoln's eldest son was almost run over by a trolley car in Broadway in New York. With ducks on it? No ducks. <laughs> okay. But the hand that reached out and grabbed him by the collar and pulled him back was John Wilkes Booth. Now, spooky. Are, are you making shit up? Then? I'm not making shit up. You're not but, making shit up. But it's, it's one of those ones, and uh, mate, you know this better than I do. When you're writing a book like this, yeah, you want to make it funny, you want to make it entertaining. And then when you suddenly get into, you're doing your research and you go, yeah, I hinted at maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. I know, I actually found a, uh, a Mr. Oates was involved in the Mile Creek Massacre and his um, sponsor at the trial was Mr. Hall, so I managed to look at the role of Hall and Oates <laughs> in the Mile <laughs> Creek Massacre. <laughs> Um, if you like this, no, seriously, I can't cope with that. Can't no, with no that. I, can't, I can't go for that. I, uh, I, I think I say that in a footnote. Um, oh, wait, actually, before I go, there, yeah, <coughs> I, well, while we're doing the Mutual Admiration Society, I love David's books. Good. One thing I love about the way he puts his humour in is, you know, the historical stuff is beautiful research, always fantastic to read. Google is wonderful. Oh, it, more, I got a of it. You are the master of the humorous footnote. Like, I'll be reading a page of David's work going, oh, interesting, interesting footnote. Oh, that's where the joke is. He put the joke in the footnote. In, in my third book, I had no book. It was just one long footnote. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we have time for questions? We do. Uh, we, we have time. We're not being kicked out. Professor. Oh, hello, Professor. <laughs> you, you dropped your mic. <laughs> David, you dropped your mic. Ah. Uh, Please don't listen. I'm Catherine and I'm a fellow nerd at Astrid 